Hello, everyone, and welcome to the With Chinese Characteristics podcast. I'm Natalie. I'm Cherry. And together we talk about topics with Chinese characteristics. So, Cherry, what is our topic for today? Our topic for today is fake it till you make it, democracy in Taiwan. Wow. So they were faking it, and now they have made it. Yes, they, they have made it. All right. So I guess we're going to talk about that process. Today's Taiwan. Officially, the Republic of China, if you're a stickler for details, is known as a vibrant modern democracy. Mm -hmm. Its presidential races, turnouts are usually over 70%. Pretty good. Its elections are free and fair and usually very competitive. In 2016, Taiwan elected its first female president. In 2019, same-sex marriages became legal, making it the first country in Asia to legalize same-sex marriages. By all means, it has a strong civil society and a progressive democracy today. Yeah. However, as recent as 30 years ago, it was a military dictatorship. It was only 25 years ago when Taiwan held its first free direct presidential election in 1996. So that's within a generation. And you say, you're saying free presidential election because they had, quote unquote, I'm doing air quotes here and excellent podcasting that you can't <laughs> see. They had, quote unquote, free presidential elections before. It was just somehow the KMT got... 98% of the vote or whatever. Well, I actually looked it up. It's not 98%, but, you know, they always won. So yeah. that's the fake it part yeah. of the democracy. So I think this is interesting to talk about, not just from a Chinese history perspective, but there's lots of countries in the world today that have basically fake elections, right? Like, yeah. you know, Russia. I mean, I guess maybe Turkey. Turkey has fake elections today? <laughs> I mean, Erdogan always wins. I mean, I mean, they don't have Belarus as a better example. It's very difficult once you have basically fake elections to mm -hmm. move towards elections that people trust. Yeah. Because they look at them very cynically. So I think this will be interesting to talk about. Yeah. So what happened, to put it into official words? Mm -hmm. How did we get here? Or how did they get there? It's a complicated story. And the journey Taiwan took from military dictatorship to democracy, it was a blend of external, internal, structural, and wildcard factors. But before we get into the more recent history, I want to give you a brief children's version of the history of Taiwan. Okay. The arrival of the ancestors of today's Taiwanese indigenous people happened at around 3000 BC. Taiwan was colonized by the Dutch in the 17th century, followed by an influx of immigrants from the Fujian and Guangdong province of mainland China. And um, the Spanish built a settlement in the north for a brief period, but were driven out by the Dutch in 1642. So Taiwan at this point was already a popular destination because yeah. it was a trade port. Um, it's got a great geolocation, strategically speaking. So kind of waves of different immigrants yes. and colonizers. Yes. And then in 1662... 18 years after the Ming Dynasty had fallen, pockets of rebel forces loyal to the fallen dynasty remained here and there, and one of them, named Deng Chenggong, defeated the Dutch and established a base of operations on the island. He was trying to use it take back to take back the mainland? mainland China. Seems like a trend. I know. Chiang Kai-shek should have learned from that. I guess if history is any lesson... He if didn't get, succeed. If, you get driven, if you're trying to take over China and you get driven to Taiwan... Probably not. Chances are. <laughs> Chances are you're going to stay in Taiwan. Yeah. 19 years later, his forces were defeated by the Qing dynasty um, in 1683. Then Taiwan became part of the Qing Empire. As a result of the first Sino-Japanese War in 1895, the Qing, Qing court ceded Taiwan to Japan. Yeah. The Taiwanese people were like, no, we're not having it. So in the same year, the Republic of Formosa was born. <laughs> the reason I said re the Republic of Formosa is because that seems to be the official name in English, when in fact the literal translation of the name Taiwan Ming Zhu Guo um, is Democratic State of Taiwan. The name Formosa came from when the Portuguese sailors sighted an uncharted island. Uncharted to them. Uncharted to them, yeah. That was like, <laughs> and noted it on their maps as Alha Formosa. Forgive okay. me for not pronouncing it right, but it means beautiful island in Portuguese. All right. Therefore, 
why the Western world calls Taiwan for most in recent history. So the Qing Dynasty was like, okay, we we lost the war, you can have Taiwan to Japan. To Japan, Taiwanese people were not having it, so they established Democratic State of Taiwan, aka Republic of Republic Taiwan. of Formosa. It was never recognized by any foreign governments, and it only lasted five months. So it was a very short-lived republic. However, in its Declaration of Independence, it said, "We, the people of Taiwan, are irrevocably resolved to die before we will serve the enemy, the Japanese. <laughs> and we have, in council, determined to convert the whole island of Taiwan into a republic state." And that the administration of all our state affairs shall be organized and carried on by the deliberations and decisions of officers publicly elected by us, the people. So that's pretty good, right? Yeah, very promising. Although in the same paragraph they went on to say, but you know we need a strong man right now <laughs> because this is a time of crisis. So we're gonna have the Qing governor slash general of Taiwan as the president. Yeah, well, because there was a whole bunch of soldiers on the island, so it's. I don't know if it's 100% clear if the quote-unquote people of Taiwan decided <laughs> yes. to be a republic. More like the warlords. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Tan Jing Song, the governor of Taiwan, became the short-lived republic's first president. And then he ran away. So his old pal Liu Yongfu, the retired Black Flag Army commander who had become a national hero in China for his victories against the French in northern Vietnam a decade earlier, Became the I guess the second president <laughs> of yeah. the Republic of Formosa. So if you want to know more about Liu Yongfu, this legendary commander, you should check out our episode, "The Invincible Black Flag Army." We'll put the link in the show notes below. Yeah, yeah, he uh, he just I guess he just liked fighting, and he just came to be a general and president on the island in his like fifties. Yes, exactly. So Japan then took over Taiwan by force, mm -hmm. um, and um, thus the end of the Republic of Formosa, Taiwan. So during the Japanese occupation, the island produced rice and sugar to be exported to the Empire of Japan. It also served as the base for the Japanese invasion of Southeast Asia and the Pacific during World War II. Painful histories. Mm -hmm. Japanese imperial in education was in implemented in Taiwan, and many Taiwanese had to fight for Japan during the war. Yeah. So the reason I say this is because there was a considerable Japanese influence. So in 1945, following the end of World War II, the nationalist government of the Republic of China, led by the KMT, the Nationalist Party, took over control of Taiwan from Japan. Yeah. A short four years later, after losing the control of mainland China in the Chinese Civil War in 1949, the ROC government, under the KMT, fled to Taiwan, and Chiang Kai-shek declared martial law immediately, basically, and that would have lasted for almost four decades on the island. You know, it's like it's like the plot of, what's that sitcom? Shit Creek? It's Shit's like, Creek. It's like, oh, we've lost everything, but we've still got the old, like... We got sh family we go house and yeah. Yeah. <laughs> let's head okay we'll head over to taiwan and well same as just creek one of my favorite shows they went to a town that they've never been to same as chan mm -hmm. yeah i feel like yeah. we could do a whole episode on the culture shock of oh of, yeah of all of the you know because there's the native taiwanese there's the earlier chinese yeah immigrants to taiwan mm -hmm. who they're, do not feel like they're, they're subject to the republic yeah. of china as and well then as, chiang yeah. kai-shek and the kmt comes in out of nowhere yeah. you know in the late 1940s and became the elites of the society because they have all the resources and all the money and yeah. all the military yeah that's a whole other episode yeah, the waves of immigrants there almost like uh like the united kingdom or something right you have all these different waves of yes people coming over little fact of history taiwan's period of martial law had been the longest period of martial law in the world at the time um, when it ended, 38 years. But it has since been surpassed by the Syrian 48-year-old <laughs> of martial law, which lasted from 1963 to 2011. I don't envy them. I feel like once you have, uh, if you have decades of martial law, it's not really martial. It's just a, it's just the law at that point. Well, right? I mean, North Korea is always under. The <laughs> I, I would argue that's the longest period yeah, of martial law. Yeah, it's just normal. Yeah. Well, so why? Why did they need to be under martial law this whole time? Well, that brings me to the next period. Okay. Which I call fake it period, which is the pretend democracy under martial law period after 1949 till maybe the mid 1970s. 
why is it under martial law? You know, why is it such a stressful, terrible situation for everyone? Yeah. It's because, well, the Republic of China was built on this political philosophy by Sun Yat-sen, the father of the country of modern China. And to summarize, the three principles are nationalism, democracy, the livelihood of the people. Land to the tiller. However, during these years, the three principles seem to take a backseat. Backseats. <laughs> there were only one principle now, which was to take back China. By that, I mean mainland China, the occupied land mm. of China. And also, by the way, it's perhaps it's not fair to say it all started after 1949. In 1947, the infamous February 28th incident slash massacre, 二二八事件 was an anti-government uprising in Taiwan that violently suppressed by the government. And there was a lot of anger with the KMTs after they took over Taiwan. Well, after they went to Taiwan, I guess, because you know they already had Taiwan. Yeah. But after everyone after、um, they assumed control of Taiwan. They already did in 1945, but more like they had fled to Taiwan. Okay. The influx of the KMTs.、Mm. People were excited at first in 1945 after Taiwan after Taiwan went back to be under China, because、yeah. you know we hate the Japanese. However, very quickly they realized that oh God, this is worse than the Japanese because <laughs> the KMT government was corrupt, or、well, seen as corrupt, undisciplined, and chaotic, and the Japanese rule Taiwan was a Very important trading port for Japan. Yeah, and they kind of had a light hand compared to、uh, some other、did. places like Korea the or because they needed the economy to do well、yeah. in Taiwan. So the local population was like, "How could this be? Now we're under new suppressors." Yeah, so they weren't happy, and because basically the KMT, they didn't view Taiwan as like a, a territory or country. They viewed it as basically like a military base. Yeah. This is our opportunity to take back China. This was purely、um, temporary. Temporary, and there was a huge difference in treatment towards people who have connections with the government, basically all of the new immigrants, and the local population. Okay. So there was uprisings against the KMT government in 1947 over corruption, and、um, very serious crackdown. The massacre, which killed thousands of civilians. Um, had begun on February twenty eighth, nineteen forty seven. It lasted a couple of weeks, and the number of Taiwanese deaths from the incident was estimated to be between eighteen thousand to twenty eight thousand. And this number was according to the official research report on responsibilities for the two two eight massacre by the Taiwanese government in the nineteen nineties. Okay, so this is yeah official numbers. Yeah. Well, after you know we have democracy. Because、so, <laughs> you can't. You know. After we're allowed to ask questions about what happened. Exactly. That's a huge number. That's、yeah. a lot of people. So this massacre marked the beginning of the White Terror, which then martial law happened. So the White Terror only ended when martial law ended forty years later. Okay. And during this time, tens and thousands of other Taiwanese people were missing,、um, assassinated, imprisoned、uh, over anything, over political opposition, over being perceived as anti-KMT or pro-communist.、Mm. But you don't have to be pro-communist to be anti-KMT. Yeah, I mean they're very corrupt. Yes. Apparently, during these thirty-eight years, as many as at least a hundred forty thousand people were were harmed, killed,、yes. killed, imprisoned,、uh, imprisoned, tortured, tortured. What you have, and、okay. you know, when I got through this part of the research, I was、yeah. thinking it would be nice if we knew the casualty account during the same thirty years across this Taiwan Strait, <laughs> but we don't, so that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not really okay, but well, you know, we have to deal. Yeah. yeah. So officially, martial law started in 1949, and during the 1950s to 1970s, the Republic of China, the KMTs, maintained an authoritarian single-party government. Elections did exist. Though not truly democratic elections, they were rigged by all means. Okay. So local elections. Could you vote for another party? <laughs> it's a single party system. So you could just you could be have you can have no party though. That's okay. Okay. But you wouldn't win. So <laughs> bribery was very common. The elections were not transparent in any way, and the KMTs had always won. For the presidential election, they had this establishment called the National Assembly, which was basically an electoral college to elect the president and the vice president. Yeah. And that's actually all the way back from Ren Shikai and all that time period, right? They had this national assembly that、yes. was supposed to pick the pick the president. Yes, and then elections were held for 
four times between 1956 to 1972, um, six years apart each yeah. time. Chiang Kai-shek won every single time. <laughs> then, <laughs> the two times after that, his firstborn son, Jiang Jingguo, the next president of Taiwan, Republic of China, won. Oh, what a coincidence. <laughs> totally honest, totally yeah. transparent and free and competitive. And this National Assembly was disbanded after direct presidential elections were established in Taiwan in the 1990s. Okay, so for the presidential election, they don't even have to fake it. No. They just, because how it's are understood. The, how are the National Assembly members elected? Were they... Well, they were supposedly, again, I'm doing air quotes, locally <laughs> elected, because okay. they were representatives of, you know, each region. Yeah. But So yeah, so that's those 40 years. So economically speaking, during these years, Taiwan, especially the later 20 years of those 40 years, mm -hmm. Taiwan became industrialized. It had seen rapid growth. In the 1970s, Taiwan was economically the second fastest growing state in Asia after Japan. And along with Hong Kong, South Korea, and Singapore, Taiwan was known as one of the four, in English, apparently you call it four Asian tigers. Mm. In Chinese, we call it the four little dragons of Asia. <laughs> <laughs> but you get it. Dragons, tigers, yeah. you know, powerful symbols. <laughs> So how did Taiwan grow so quickly? Was it... Some would argue that this is the authoritarian government that's very efficient, same as the argument for China today, mm. for People's Republic of China today. Some other would say, well, no, America, as an example, basically propped Taiwan's economy up and had injected all sorts of investment and funding um, to help Taiwan get ahead. And the U.S. is perfectly happy Yeah. Uh, to... I mean, if there's an authoritarian government that likes us, yeah. And we know the same guy's going to get elected every year. During the Cold War... The devil you know. That's a good ally to have, right? Yes, exactly. If they have free elections, who knows? They could vote a communist in, and then it's all over. That's the fear of the KMTs and the Americans. <laughs> yeah. So, so, yeah. Once again, you know, economy growth doesn't mean everything. Everyone keeps saying. But. Mm -hmm. And hamburgers and jeans don't bring democracy. What about rock and roll? Oh, Maybe uh, rock and roll. I would like to call this... Next period, a transitional period, which was from the 1970s to 1990s. During these like 20 years, we have troubles home and abroad. Mm -hmm. So first, Taiwan had a lot of external pressure. The People's Republic of China was admit admitted into the UN, United Nations, in 1971. And this I didn't know, on the 21st time of voting on its application. <laughs> so we had to apply for 21 years. And finally, <laughs> it's here. <laughs> Zhou Enlai had done a lot of diplomatic, <laughs> like, hard work. Every year they go in and they fill out the little paperwork and they, they, they slide it in. Like, this year we'll have more African, like, countries that will vote for us. It's like that we have the, established relationships it's with. It's like going to the DMV. And so that's the famous... That's the famous normalization of relations with Nixon and Kissinger well, and all the that. the next year, 1972, Nixon, Richard Nixon visited China. Mm. Back in mainland China, the Cultural Revolution was ending. And PRC was going into the period of what we had mentioned in the last episode. Eliminating chaos. What is it called? Eliminating chaos and returning to normal period. It's getting its act together. China was get, about to get its shit together. Yeah. And then 1979, United States um, switched diplomatic re recognition from Taipei. They did throw Taiwan a bone. The U.S. Congress passed the Taiwan Relations Act, promising to help the island defend itself and sell, sell them lots of weapons. They passed the bill to help Taiwan, quote-unquote, defend itself, right, mm -hmm. as a neutralizing force. However, they did include a section about human rights in the bill. Key members of Congress who paid attention, special attention, to Taiwan's human rights situation were, there were four of them apparently, and but one of them was Ted Kennedy, big names, yeah. um, were backing it. And these four senators were sometimes called the Gang of Four, which is very ironic because we also had the Gang of Four in China yeah. out of Cultural Revolution. Um, so these members criticized the KMT government's martial law. It's very cruel ways to deal with its political opponents. And in 1984, this event had shocked America, which was called Jiangnan Shijian, Jiangnan Event. This Taiwanese-American writer and journalist, Jiangnan, was a vocal critic of the KMTs, and he wrote many articles and books that were critical of the government and the Chiang family. Yeah. In 1984, apparently he was about to publish another book, a biography of Jiang Jingguo, the then president of the Republic of China, the son of Chiang Kai-shek. Mm -hmm. 
he was assassinated in front of his home, he was a naturalized citizen of the United States. So is this in and this had happened in Dali City, California, which is a city in Northern California. And he was assassinated by Bamboo Union members. I know it translates to English. It kind of sounds <laughs> funny. But it's actually, a, it's a game, you know, it's mafia in Taiwan. Mm-hmm. And, um, and the, these, men, these assassins um, apparently had been reportedly trained by the Republic of China military intelligence. And the assassination was ordered by the Taiwan's military intelligence bureau. So the, Basically, Taiwanese, Taiwan CIA. Yeah, and the KMT has a long history of kind of co-opting and using organized crime groups oh yeah to deal with situations uh, with some kind of plausible deniability yeah so basically it was shocking and america wasn't really happy about <laughs> it as you can see because you have diplomatic relationships in a way right you're friendly nations and yet yeah. you do this and this was a big deal i found a new york times article at the time titled death of critic of taiwan leader stirs fear monger among chinese in the u.s <laughs> which I think I thought it was nice because back in 1984, they were still ta- ta- calling them Chinese. So <laughs> well, that's kind of funny, though. Today, they the, wouldn't. But that's the opposite of today, right? It's like now it's like, oh, p- people in people in the U.S., Chinese people in the U.S. are worried about blowback from yeah, the Manly People's China. Republic of China, mainland yeah. China. Also, 1984, China was actually a very pretty open time. Yeah, uh, trying to get us period. act together. Yeah. So I'm going to quote this article. It says, the killing of a Chinese writer, again, it's nice of them to calling him Chinese, um, in San Francisco shortly after he published a critical biography of the president, Jiang Jingguo of Taiwan, had stirred widespread fear among Chinese intellectuals in the United States that they may be in danger. Same can be said today. It has mm-hmm. really terrified a lot of Chinese, said a Chinese scholar at the University of California at Berkeley, who was a close friend of the victim, Henry Liu. Some people were too scared to come to Henry's funeral. Some think they are next on the list. He asked that his name not to be used because his wife was worried about his safety. I so, mean, or also of their families back in Taiwan, if they had families in Taiwan, right? I mean, yeah. Not just here. Yes. It's not a new, it's not a new method, by the way. It's, yeah. just, it's the oldest play in the book, but, mm-hmm. but this was still shocking. And at the same time, this was not the only shocking, like, atrocities mm-hmm. had done by the Taiwan CIA, okay. <laughs> basically. This other very famous event had also was very shocking, and this was called the Lin Family Massacre. In February 1980, a leader of the democratic movement was in detention and beaten severely by the KMT police. His wife saw him in prison and contacted the Amnesty International Osaka office, you know, some international organizations. Yeah. And the next day, the descendant's mother and his twin daughter, six years old, um, were stabbed to death. Twin daughters, two of them. Um, His oldest daughter, nine years old at the time, was badly wounded in his home. The Taiwanese authorities claimed to know nothing about it, even though his house in Taipei City was under 24-hour police surveillance. Yeah. So it's a bit obvious. So I'm and assuming this probably was kind of also like an organized crime thing. Apparently, they never caught who did it. Yeah, well. Unlike the <laughs> California case. Yeah. Um, but again, this was something that everyone can, internationally, everyone can, can have sympathy for. Yeah. It was a grandmother and two yeah. twin girls. So internationally speaking, there's a lot of pressure. They've really improved their image a lot since <laughs> then. <laughs> they really did it, yes. <laughs> well, you could say that in these 10 years, they... In the 1970s and early 1980s, their their international image went like downhill real fast. Yeah. While China's went uphill real quick too. Mm-hmm. So it was completely the opposite. Yeah. And internally, the pot was boiling too. So in 1975, Chiang Kai-shek had died. His vice president became the president briefly. Then his son, Jiang Jingguo, was elected president in the next election by the National Assembly. Mm-hmm. Again, a fair election <laughs> uh, body. Then in you 19- say with sarcasm. I, I do, yes. Okay. In 1979, an incident had happened that's called Mei Li Dao Shi Jian, Mei Li Dao incident. And this was a crackdown on pro democracy demonstrations that had occurred in Taiwan. Um, and 1979, this demonstration happened under martial law. Mm. This was a gathering of the pro democracy activists of the island together. They held a demonstration commemorating Human Rights Day to promote and demand democracy in Taiwan. 
human rights days, December 10th, which is when this happened. Mm -hmm. And the government used this protest as an excuse to arrest many leaders of the political opposition. And the suppression was violent. Tear gas was fired. Armored cars dispatched. Although, apparently, 200 people total were injured on that day, and 180 of them were the police. So this was <laughs> no Tiananmen Square. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, so it was Well, it's quite possible that a lot more of the protesters were injured, and they just... Well, they went home. Yeah. yeah. And they, well, they probably didn't want to go to the hospital. Yes. Because that's one way they get you. Yes. They arrest you at the hospital. Yes. But this was not, this was not a massacre. And you still, know, though, it was very shocking to the international community. You've got two types of authoritarian governments, and only one of them is going to last for very long. You're either, yep. you're either willing to have machine gun people in the streets, or you're not. Yeah, and, and this, is, this one is not... After Chiang Kai-shek died, I don't think his son had quite the same yeah. willingness, you know, or that, you know, that like Deng Xiaoping was going to have in Tiananmen Square to just, get, to just <laughs> kill everybody if they won't go home. Yes. I would also like to say, though, it was the previous administration of under Chiang Kai-shek. It's not just him. Yeah, yeah. Because the whole party was, it was, you know. Behind him. It was behind him, yeah. Huh. So that's not, it's not a great man theory. Yeah. So, so this was shocking, both domestically and internationally. Mm -hmm. And across the Taiwan Strait, China, the other China, was like, oh, yeah, this is our opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> so they're... No, they're the ones being crazy. Yeah. No, so now they are condemning the Taiwanese government internationally and <laughs> you know, doing all this stuff. Like, look what they're doing. And the CCP still had this idea at the time that if we take down the KMTs, we would have Taiwan because KMTs own Taiwan. So they yeah. were like, our enemy's enemy is our friend. Mm. Meaning that this pro-democracy, sometimes even very radical Taiwanese independence people, the people who go, let's not be China anymore, right? Yeah. They're like, that's our friends. Because <laughs> they can destabilize the KMTs, and then we can take over. However, I think that was a, little, a bit of a naivete, you know? So they didn't quite see that the wind was shifting. Yeah. And um, this event had the effects of galvanizing the Taiwanese community and the large masses, just everyday people, especially in the middle class, into political action. The arrestees were illegally tortured. Their trials were highly publicized. And this was shocking at the time because newspapers were, quote unquote, allowed to report on the trials and um, no death penalty had been issued mm. for the defendants, which many thought was a signal. If you're treating it like you're still in a war yeah. with communist China, yeah. right? it's like a mutiny. Yeah. Right. It's like a military unit. And then uh, some of the soldiers, you know, say they're not going to fight. Yes. Right. So it's they could have just gone. No, these are these are the people that's going to shake yeah. this just hang single party, yeah. single party government. Just put them against a wall and shoot them. Yes. And they could have done that, which, mm. again, might have even bigger outcry mm. internationally and from America <laughs> and from the game of four, apparently. But, but they, they did. didn't. Many of the activists from this event and their lawyers went on to become leaders of the Taiwanese democratic movement, and many are still active in politics today. Hmm. The first Taiwanese vice president that was that was a woman came from this. Well, what was arrested were, in this? Because if you were twenty, then you're only sixty now, which is yeah. not that old to be in politics. Exactly. This was in 1979. Okay. And then in 1989, Tiananmen Square had happened in mainland China, which had shocked the world. That was a shock yeah. to the Taiwanese movement because even though 10 years ago, it was like, okay, shit, China's getting shit together. Yeah. But today, it's more like, well, we have to move faster because otherwise, this is going to happen to us. Yeah. So. Is it Tsai Ing-wen, the president? Tsai Ing-wen, yeah, the current yeah, president. Yeah, the current president of, of Taiwan has said that, um, you know. Today's Hong Kong, tomorrow's Taiwan? Yeah, well, mm -hmm. yeah, because, you know, she was like. Is that what you're going to say, though? More or less, that okay. she used to go to Hong Kong to buy banned books. Yeah. Um, because they were banned in Taiwan because <laughs> it was a military dictatorship. Yeah. Right? And, you know, and now obviously Hong Kong is, you know, basically banning stuff too. But, but you know, this idea of like the kind of grip was loose, you know, was, was, was loosening. And I think people decided like now's our chance. We got to, we got to do this before. Seize the opportunity. Yeah, seize the opportunity and break this single party system yes so now we've talked about internal struggles and external pressures mm -hmm. at the same time steps were taken internally for reforms in the taiwanese government okay 1984 jiang jingguo the then president handpicks taiwan-born politician li Denghui as vice president to eventually succeed him 
okay. which was a signal. That the fact that he was born in Taiwan was a big deal. In 1986, Jiang Jingguo pledges political reform, including a free press, and he lifted the bans on new political parties and street protests. And this had, you know, encouraged and emboldened dis- dissidents to form Taiwan's first opposition party, the Democratic Progressive Party,、mm. which is the、uh, one of the two major political parties in Taiwan today. Yeah. And in 1987, the martial law was officially lifted. And in 1988, Jiang Jingguo, the president, passed away. So this all happened really quickly.、Mm-hmm. And his vice president succeeded him during his turn. The constitution was amended, and real steps, more real steps, were taken to constitutionalize the democratic reforms. To get a rule of law. To get a rule of law, figure out how to do elections, who can vote, <laughs> which、yeah. is a big problem. I'm gonna be a little mean, but there was still the fiction at this point that、oh, yeah. that that Taiwan, the people, the Republic of China, was the real China. Yeah. And that everyone in mainland China was a citizen. Yeah. Of the Republic of China. Living in occupied territory. Yeah, I came from the occupied territory. <laughs> <Yeah> . They live in the freedom territory, <laughs> the freedom area. <laughs> 1991, the Constitution Amendment, ROC, the Republic of China government, defined its national territory to Taiwan and pockets of islands around it.、Mm-hmm. At the same time, it acknowledges the the CCP's rule in mainland China was legal. Okay. They no longer call it a rebel government. They just call <laughs> it a government now.、Mm. Okay. Now we're nations to nations, but you know, like we, we want to declare independence. It's not Taiwan. It's still China and China. However, we must acknowledge and move forward instead of living this pipe dream. Also, we can't let those people in the mainland vote. Well, yeah, exactly. So they had to <laughs> define who can vote, right? <laughs> and it's people. They had to say it's people who live in these regions, quote unquote, the freedom regions, <laughs> not the people living mainland China.、Mm. And it didn't really matter too much before because you knew who was going to win. Oh yeah, it didn't really matter. Well, no, it's a real problem. <laughs>、yeah. Now, if you really want real elections, you have to do this. You got to have rules. Yeah. So these are the rules, and they changed the、um, presidential elections to be direct elections.、Mm. So again, better than better than the U.S. <laughs> We still have an electoral college. You still do exactly. I know. So we got to catch up with Taiwan. I know. So the first presidential election happened in 1996. If you have had fake elections for many years, it's、yeah. really hard to build a confidence and trust in clean elections. And and I think it's not even th- just that you're afraid that the elections are going to be rigged. Yeah. I think it's also you have fear of reprisals, right? Yeah. You have fear of like. Well, what if this is just an elaborate scheme,、yes. and if I vote for the opposition party, I know I'm going to get targeted. Yeah, in 1994, two years before the first presidential election,、mm-hmm. they held local elections, and during that election, the Taipei City, the biggest city of Taiwan, basically the capital,、um, mayor was the opposition party、mm. that had won it, and the second biggest city had the KMT w- candidate won its mayor seat. So everyone was probably waiting to see: Are they actually going to let this opposition guy be the mayor? Right, exactly. <laughs> right, and they did, and he went on to become the president in、mm. the following elections. And in 1996, the first direct presidential slash general election was held. The outcome was that Li Denghui, who was already the president, was elected. He won、uh, with a majority of 56 percent of the vote. And during this election, China. Across the well, the other China. The Strait. Yeah, across the Strait was like throwing a fit. <laughs> fit, throwing a fit. Yeah, throwing a fit. This was like the third Taiwan, Taiwan Strait like crisis. crisis, and you know there were missile tests, there were there were threats,、um, and apparently their goal was to intimidate the Taiwanese voters and discourage them from supporting Li Denghui, which. I don't really get why. So maybe I just don't know about this enough. So our <laughs> listeners, I, <laughs> if you know more about this, tell me because、what? Li Denghui was the KMT candidate, and the other party was <laughs> was not gonna, you know, was、um, not a pro Chinese party. Was not a pro Chinese party. So <laughs> this was the best you were ever gonna get. But well, maybe I, they were thinking they were still stuck with that at my enemies, you know. Well, enemies, my friend. I know in Hong Kong's case, right? You know, like the British toyed with. Elections in Hong Kong, like 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 full democracy、mm-hmm. in Hong Kong, and basically China's like, we're gonna invade if you do that. Like we're not、yeah. because they don't want democratic elections normalized,、yeah. right? In、yeah. these regions because it makes it harder 
if you're ever going to try and take the place back, right? It, mm-hmm. it in a way they'd rather have an authoritarian government keeping the seat warm. Oh yeah, <laughs> then they can be like, look at what they're doing for yeah, human rights, rather than uh, them actually being a democracy. At least for, that's. I so think you're saying their problem of, was the was was the election was with a smooth, real, non-corrupt election. Yeah, and I think because that sets a precedent that then it's it's hard to break. So the tactics backfired. Voter turnout was 76 percent, which is incredible, right? Mm-hmm. And then in four years, 2000, another presidential election, and this time the opposition party won. The mayor. <laughs> of Taipei City <laughs> now is the president mm. and that was the first uh, peaceful transition of power in Taiwan and I mean, that's Kui, almost the first traditional peaceful transition of power in the Republic of Chinese history right if you consider like all the way back with Sun Yat-sen yeah all those people were just taking power from each other at the barrel of a gun exactly and Li Denghui the previous president could mm-hmm. have decided to run again <laughs> and he would have won because he had hearts and minds you know of the Taiwanese people with all these demo- democratic um, reforms that he was doing but he decided not to which was very important so Taiwan has very strict election laws if you take a close look at it and I was very surprised because apparently no campaign events by anyone on the day of the election and you know how in America you can, you know, you can't campaign at the polling station. Yeah. But you can have TV ads on the day. Yeah. You could do whatever. In Taiwan, it's like if you post, if you're just the person, you're not the candidate, you're not the, um, the CPAC of the paint candidate, whatever. It's, yeah. You, you just, if you talk about it on the, on the internet, if you talk about it on Facebook, you, you say, oh, all my neighbors, you should vote for this guy. That's illegal. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. So that's very strict. And, um, you know, they have no signature on ballots. It's completely anonymous. The elections are very local and very grassroots. People in general trust the elections. The general elections, it's always a Saturday, mm. which America doesn't even have. And no. there's all these problems of like, should we make this a national holiday or not? Should we encourage, you know, minimum wage like workers to vote or not? How do we make it happen? And they're already there. <laughs> in recent years, though, they have to they had to establish an anti-infiltration act because, again, across the Taiwan Strait, <laughs> the other China is staring at you yeah. at all times. Because you speak the same language, you have the same culture, you know, you have all these economic activities going on of this trade. People going back and forth. People going back and forth. Maybe not the last year. But. Maybe. <laughs> no, not during the pandemic. You know, it's not without its challenges to keep this democracy going, yeah. is my point. But they're trying very hard. In 2008, the KMT won the presidency and that was the second peaceful transition of power and during the same year president ma ying made an official apology expressing hope that there would never be a tragedy similar to the white terror again which is a huge thing you know am i going to live to the day that the ccp <laughs> apologizes for <laughs> well i don't know so many things well they, well, they won't even admit the, the culture revolution happened. exactly how are they going to apologize for it right so and in a way that's very powerful because saying that from the government, because this is not a dictatorship anymore. Yeah, you can move forward. You now, can try to do better. Now we're just a political party. Yeah, and we're gonna do better. This mm-hmm. is what they're saying. I don't know if they are actually doing better. Seeing the candidate they had, they had thrown out uh, in the past several elections. But I think they've gotten a little crazy now that. Uh, yeah. They don't really know how to compete with. Uh, no, because they've the lost Green. their legitimacy and their sort of ideology, yeah. which was, this is our China. Yeah. Yeah. We're gonna take it back. Yeah. <laughs> and in 2016, Tsai Ing-wen was elected president, the opposition party. Maybe I should stop calling it the opposition party because <laughs> now we have two equal parties, right? Yeah. The, um, the progressive party had won again. And this was the third time of the peaceful transition. Yeah. And interestingly, um, you know, th- Donald Trump was, seemed like he was popular in Taiwan for a second. And, but there was a lot of pushbacks because there is this trust in democracy and this determination to keep it, you know, to, to keep the spirit of democracy going, to mm-hmm. keep the institution going. Yeah. And the pushbacks and of the civil society says you don't want to vote for someone like Donald Trump who gambles with democracy. Yeah. Even though it seemed like, which is not true, that he's anti-China, meaning that our enemy's enemy is our friend. Yeah. So, so I thought that was good. 
Yeah, I mean, I yeah. mean, Donald Trump would have fit right in in like the seventies camp. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> so I do want to put an important disclaimer though at the end of this episode. Yeah, which is I. Am in many ways a biased narrator of all this, not of the historical facts, but of my sentiments, maybe. And also, which facts you choose to share. And exactly because, as a Chinese person who was educated and raised in mainland China, Taiwan democracy gives me hope. And <laughs> why is that a bad thing? From my perspective, the fact that this works and the fact that this will continue to work. By this, I mean democracy in Taiwan. Um, hopefully, it will continue to work. Means that there is nothing about my culture that's anti-democratic inherently,、mm-hmm. and no matter what people say about democracy is a Western institution, over ninety-five percent of Taiwan's two point like twenty-four million people are Han Chinese, which is more than mainland China, <laughs> right? <It's> yeah. A, <laughs> so again, but that my my view on that might be you know it's one view. On the other hand, Taiwan's democracy is the result of many, many years of tears and blood sacrificed by the Taiwanese people. Yeah, and some may say that the Chinese part of this society was brought in by the KMTs, literally the Nationalist Party. Yeah, and they had to overcome this KMT government because to them, a lot of times it was just another form of suppression. It was an outsider, just like the Japanese. Yeah, and it was. Self determination that had made democracy happen in Taiwan, Chinese or not. Although I still like to say it's Chinese, you know. <laughs> But again, that's why it makes me a biased narrator. And of course, you also need someone at the same time who's not willing to have a Tiananmen Square, who's not willing to machine gun the protesters, yeah, who's not willing to have bloodshed, who's not willing to have a. So they essentially, you could see this as the government folded their hands. But without the activism, right? Without the Protests、push. without the grassroots fighting of the people, th- they wouldn't have done it themselves. Yeah, they have no incentive. This wouldn't have happened. Yeah, I mean, I think it's you know obviously Taiwan's an interesting place, right? Because it's there's no just one culture that can lay total claim to what Taiwan is today, right? Because you have the original native peoples, you know what I mean? Indigenous people. Yeah, indigenous peoples. You have waves of immigrants from China. You have A lot of Japanese, many different generations of waves. And yeah, they, many generations. Sometimes they don't like each、waves. other either. Yeah, <laughs> you have yeah. Japanese influence. Yeah, right. You、mm-hmm. have American influence. Yeah,、um, you have you know the KMT influence, right? Yeah, and hard to say you know what part of that is dominant, but I mean yeah, in in the end, it's their democracy because they want it to be, and the people there and the government, yeah, the people there and whoever culturally they you know adhere to. Mm-hmm. And the government was either unable or unwilling to just to just tear them and square them. I know. I mean, that's what Donald Trump wanted to do to people. Yeah. So last little point: How does China,、uh, the the other China, <laughs> the main China, yeah, <laughs> the main China, as recognized internationally,、mm-hmm. covers Taiwan elections? Because you know it happens every four years. It's、oh, a、yeah. big deal. <laughs> and 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 I've seen. I I mean I've seen articles in People's Daily. Yeah. <laughs> complaining about like Tsai Ing-wen and like、yeah. saying don't vote for her. Yeah, but it's like, well, but you're, but in a way, you're admitting then that they have a democracy and well, you can vote. We call her the regional leader of Taiwan, <laughs> which is the region of China. I'm surprised you don't call her the warlord of the Taiwan, warlord of, right? You sort of dance around the issue. When Taiwan had passed、um, same-sex marriage, a lot of Chinese netizens were joking that, hey, we have same-sex marriages now. <laughs> So liberal, <laughs> so progressive, you know. And at the same time, when it covers Taiwanese elections, the state media argue that it is a waste of time. Look how inefficient it is. Look at these fist fightings in the Taiwanese <laughs> Congress, which does happen again. Competitive d- democracy, <laughs> yeah, vibrant, you know, <laughs> Tem- active. Tempers can get active. Yes. So that argument actually did work at one time, and I honestly felt like it did work. 1980s, 1990s, even the early 2000s, right?、Yeah. China was China's economy was fast growing, and without its state-sponsored capitalism,、yeah. it might not have happened in the way it did. And those were the years where ideology was not so important as much as economic growth, right? White cat, black cat, whoever, whichever catches the mouse is the is the good cat. Yeah, as famously said by Deng Xiaoping. However, now. 
in the past five years. We five to eight years. Ideology plays a more and more a, a bigger and bigger importance society in daily lives of the Chinese people. Repoliticized. Exactly. And so now when like every I don't know, it's not everyone in society, but like every school teacher, you know, every I don't know, every um public entity like uh, employee, which is a lot of them, by the way, yeah. um have to learn from the little red book. Or Xi Jinping thoughts, excuse me. Yeah. My apologies. Uh, we've got to move on with the times, you know. We'll, so. <laughs> but you, you can no longer argue that because yeah. now the economic growth has slowed and you can no longer say, hey, we're here to be a modern, efficient society. We're here to compete. To be apolitical. To be apolitical. We're here to follow the rule of law, to make China into a friendly investment destination. And I'll get rich. And we'll all get rich and it will be great. Which did work. Up until a point. Up until a point. And now we've turned back and you can no longer argue that democracy is inefficient. It does. It just doesn't work as well because we, now we are inefficient. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, and I think obviously it is. It's not hard. And we talked about this in our episode, right? Yeah. In our episode on the 2020 U.S. election and its coverage in China. But it's not hard to look at the shit show that was the 2020 election and January 6th and all that else yeah, and go like, and, and point at the U S or democracies in general and go like, you know, guys don't want that. Do you, you mm -hmm. know, yeah. but, but when what you have is worse, <laughs> then you're like, well, maybe we could try it. You know, like, well, it's not your choice. I know it's not your choice. So I don't know. Well, that's a depressing note on what I thought would be a very <laughs> hopeful episode. Well, it is. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, Taiwan doesn't need our hope. They're doing all right. We yeah. don't need to be hopeful for them. Mm -hmm. But assuming you feel like us and you think that self-government and representative government is a net positive, it's what you should be working towards. Taiwan is like the poster child of like the third wave democratic movement internationally, mm -hmm. so to speak. It didn't require civil war. People did sacrifice a lot yeah but by large we could there is no it's a pretty peaceful transition you could argue that the white terror and all of that that was a, was civil a 38 war. year old civil war that was a 38 year civil war yeah and you know and they had quote unquote won with the start of reform hopefully that's a good background for people for how taiwan got from chiang kai-shek's private military island base <laughs> to yeah <laughs> to you know the most a vibrant modern progressive democracy possibly the most progressive in all of asia yes. you know just to end i know we're the with chinese characteristics podcast but given that we live in north america and we i guess living a democracy that is one of the oldest democracies in the world mm -hmm. i feel like as mature as a democracy as america is it could take a few tips from taiwan <laughs> democracy electoral college reform mm -hmm. um you know the voting day being a holiday Polit the strict camping laws a, a lot can be improved upon and it's always a moving target but in a way that's a good thing because you're always you know you should always be improving the democracy yeah it's not a solved problem yeah no. well uh thank you for listening everybody and uh if you like our podcast maybe if you liked our podcast I'm not very confident in marketing ourselves, Jerry. Well, I will. This episode marks the end of season two. Which is a very arbitrary decision we've made about how long our seasons are going to be. Yes. Um, but we will be back shortly after two to three weeks, <laughs> which now I think about it is sometimes the gap between episodes within the season anyways. <laughs> so we'll be back and we will see you next time. Have a nice day.